welcome everyone, those in the room and also those online. Thanks very much for joining us today um, for this wonderful seminar titled The Politics of Energy Flows in the Asia Pacific. And it's hosted by Melbourne Climate Futures. My name is Sangeetha Chandrasekharan, and um, I'm a senior research fellow here at the University of Melbourne, and I'll be moderating today the presentation um, by Tyler Harlan, which we're very lucky to have. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters on which we, um, this seminar is taking place, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement to any First Nations people with us today, um, or for those of you joining us online um, from traditional lands around Australia or elsewhere. Just a um, acknowledgement that this is these are lands and waters that have never been ceded. Today's seminar, um, as I mentioned, is hosted by Melbourne Climate Futures, um, which brings together research and expertise from across the university, but also outside the university in order to learn, educate and guide discussions on climate change. Uh, just to note that this session is being recorded and the recording will be available next week on the University of Melbourne's YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, there'll be time for questions and answers. Tyler's going to speak for about 40 minutes. Um, and after that, we'll take questions both online and in person. Um, for those of you online, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, and you can leave questions during the seminar if you like, and we'll pick them up at the end. Um, please also upload questions that you particularly like to be answered. So um, let me introduce um, Associate Professor Tyler Harlan, who is from the Loyola Marymount University in California. And he is an Associate Professor of Urban and Environmental Studies. Tyler's work is absolutely fascinating. He, what, he looks at both the spatial politics and the socio-environmental implications of um, the energy transition in China and the implications of this for the Global South. So he brings um, a lot of expertise um, both technical, political, social, and geographic knowledges together um, to really talk about um, uh, energy developments, both at the project scale, but also at a much wider scale in the broader implications of this. Um, he has many accolades, and you can read about these, but he's um, a Woodrow Wilson Center China Fellow and a Fulbright China Fellow, um, and he's published in very significant um, journals such as Global Environmental Change. We're really lucky that Tyler's here with us in Australia this year, and um, he's at the University of Melbourne in the um, Centre for Contemporary China Studies until August. Um, so there are uh, opportunities to catch up with Tyler outside of this seminar as well and hear more from him. But we're very lucky to have Tyler speaking today, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Sangeetha, for that really kind introduction. And it's a, it's a privilege to be introduced by you too because I've admired your work for a long time. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Theo, uh, also for organizing the talk today and Melbourne Climate Futures for hosting me. Um, so yes, I'm Tyler Harlan. I'm from Loyola Marymount University that's in LA. Uh, and I'm here for the, the year um, on sabbatical uh, at the Center for Contemporary Chinese Studies, as um, Sangeetha mentioned. The, the talk I want to give today is actually a new project, but it builds on a lot of existing research. And so I know it's always a little bit risky to talk about new stuff, but I wanted to present it here anyways, and feel free to offer your feedback. Um, uh, this is something I wanna to continue to pursue over the next couple of years. And I also recognize that the title is different, uh, Sengi, than the one that you had and the one that was posted. And it's because I wanna foreground this concept of the power shed, which I'll be talking a little bit about later. Um, this is part of a broader kind of research agenda that I'm building over the next few years about new power geographies of energy transition, tracing both flows of kind of actual power, uh, right, electric power, um, alongside flows of political and economic power that shape the geography and distribution of costs and benefits of the transition. I do have a pretty strong China focus in my work. Um, today, I'll focus on China and Southeast Asia, which shorthand call it the Asia Pacific, but I'm also interested in broader questions um, in all types of geographies as well. Uh, hence my strong interest in seeing this work. It'll take about 40 minutes and then I'll, I'll leave plenty of time for um, questions at the end. Um, so let me 
Here we go. Let me start with a, with a tale of two Asian cities. Okay, so in 2020, China announced its dual carbon or Shuangtan goal of peaking emissions by 2030 and reaching net zero by 2060. Uh, this is for a country that's still largely based on coal. It's about 75% of power generation. This is a pretty highly ambitious target. And it's one that's going to be have to met city by city and province by province. Some cities in China, generally the richer ones on China's east coast, have made more headway towards this target than others already. Shanghai, pictured here, is leading the way, according to a recent piece in China Dialogue, with 30% of coal in its energy mix compared to the rest of China, which is about 70, 75%. Um, but it needs uh, far, far more than this. It needs many thousands of gigawatts. Okay, so that's one city, and here's the other. Like China, Singapore has also announced an ambitious target to be net zero by 2050, or a decade ahead of China, with carbon peaking uh, to occur sometime in just the next few years. And this is especially aggressive given that Singapore's electricity is over 95% sourced from natural gas currently. Singapore is, you know, it's a small island compared to China. Its overall energy demand is lower by orders of magnitude. So it's not really comparable in that way. But this commitment still represents a wholesale reset of its energy system and a vast deployment of renewables. So I think it's worthwhile comparing them regardless. There is a problem, yes. Um, where are Shanghai and Singapore going to put this new renewable energy? These are two satellite images of the two cities. This is evident when we look at them. Um, so here's, here's Shanghai and here's Singapore. Uh, they're both incredibly urbanized places. We can see some evidence of, of forest and agricultural land. In Shanghai, there's a, a giant island here called Chongming Island. Um, it's actually been rebranded as Chongming Eco Island. It already has a lot of renewable energy already built out. Singapore on the right is building out floating solar and uh, also has plans to build a lot of renewable energy within its territory. Um, but back on, to Shanghai here, Chongming Island, which looks quite large here and actually already has 500 megawatts of solar. I mean, we're talking about thousands of gigawatts that Shanghai needs. It's simply not enough and it never will be. Um, and Looking at Singapore again, there are some islands of green, but these are nature parks. We really want to replace those with renewables. Um, not to mention, is there even enough wind and solar potential in these places to make this work? And so I, I'm building towards a very obvious point that, that everyone already knows, which is they're not going to build it in their own territory. They are going to implement it. Um, this is a photo. It's not my own because I am definitely not allowed into this kind of inner sanctum place. This is a photo of the Beijing Control Center for Long Distance Electricity Transmission for China's state grid. This coordinates flows into Shanghai, even though it's based in Beijing, which shows you how centralized this process is in China. Um, that's because Shanghai, as you definitely guessed, uh, already imports electricity. It needs to import more, but it already does. It imports about 50% of its electricity from outside of its region, which I'm going to call the Yangtze River Delta region, which is this massive megalopolis that includes other cities besides Shanghai that all just kind of run together. And so outside of that region is where this electricity is coming from, over 50%. Uh, Singapore, um, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. It doesn't really import much electricity yet, but it does import its natural gas. And so it's still relying on imports, but imports of fuels. Um, both have plans to significantly ramp up electricity imports into their municipalities, and in the case of Singapore, into their country. Um, essentially, almost all new renewable energy that is added to these cities' energy mix is going to be imported. Well, if these cities are importing, it means someone else is exporting. To preview a bit, which I'll get into more detail later, for Shanghai, these exports mainly come from hydropower in Hubei and Sichuan provinces further to the west. And then newer flows are coming from solar and wind in China's northwest. Uh, for Singapore, it's simpler. They currently uh, import electricity from one place. They import hydropower from Laos. And it's only been very recently that this started happening. And this is what we're seeing here. This is in Laos. This is the Shaiaburi Dam. It's Laos' largest at 1.2 gigawatts. It's located on the lower Mekong River. There are 10 more dams planned on the stretch of river. 
And for both of these scenarios, both of these cities, Shanghai and Singapore, we're talking about distances of uh, importing and exporting, so transmission distances of about 2,500 kilometers. So pretty far. Um, so to deliver this electric power is an already extensive and still growing network of high voltage transmission lines at both AC and DC. Sangeeta and I were talking about this earlier. I'll apologize to any power engineers here because uh, I'm just gonna talk about AC and DC from a standpoint, uh, more of kind of a political economy standpoint rather than an engineering one. But I do wanna distinguish these two types and talk about why they're important. So the first type, AC, uh, high voltage uh, AC or alternating current, are lines ranging for, from 400 to 1,000 kilovolts that connect AC grids. These networks generally have multiple nodes that allow for electricity transmission to multiple load centers. And these nodes also allow more easily for like, future addition of, of new lines. Um, these AC, high voltage AC corridors, they tend to be um, a little bit more limited in capacity, so just lower capacity for transmission and employed over shorter distances than direct current transmission, DC, which is what I'll talk about now. So in contrast or by contrast, uh, high voltage DC transmission, or in the case of what China is building, ultra high voltage DC transmission, um, utilize high capacity lines that are specific, specifically or specially built for long distance electricity transfer from specific power plants or clusters of power plants. Um, they're generally only considered to be economical DC lines for distances over 500 kilometers. Um, some lines, uh, again, they'll originate from a cluster of power plants, like a cluster of hydropower plants, say a cascade. Some of them, if the plant is really big, like the Three Gorges Dam or something like that, it might just originate from one. Um, these corridors that use DC lines, they're uh, more direct direct current, they're more direct, that means they go from one place to another place, then they experience, this is really important, they experience less transmission loss than AC because they evacuate directly to load centers with few voltage transformations. Um, we're actually looking in this image at an ultra high voltage DC line in China. It's uh, one of China's newest and it's, it's biggest. It's actually called the Power Silk Road. And it's a 1,100 kilovolt line that stretches 3,000 kilometers from Northwest China's Xinjiang Autonomous Region to Anhui Province near the Yangtze River Delta. So basically to Shanghai, 3,000 kilometers. Um, this is the network that links the exporter to the importer and the network that's essential to meeting climate goals in both of these cities and in both of these countries. So this transmission network forms the material basis for a concept that my colleagues and I have proposed that was in the title that I provided of the talk, which is the power shed. Um, the power shed was initially conceptualized um, by one of these colleagues I've been working with, his name's Darren McGee, uh, who's at Western Washington University, and he conceptualized it as uh, very similar to a watershed um, in that it represents the space over which a portable resource, water or electricity, is collected and concentrated for use, with use frequently occurring far from the site of collection, or in the case of electricity, generation. That was his original definition. We've subsequently, with other colleagues, modified this concept to emphasize both the material energy that flows through power shed infrastructure, like power plants, transmission lines, and transformers, that kind of infrastructure, and then the actual electricity that flows through it, but also the socio-political power relations that shape these flows and their infrastructure. So both the material and the socio-political. This allows us to map and analyze regional power geographies that are emerging in the transition to renewable energy, which often, uh, but not always, but often political power follows the path of electric power. It flows from exporter to importer. And so we're tracing those flows as well, flows of political power. This is a, a figure which I'm not gonna go into too much detail into. It's from a 2022 paper that we published together with Miggy and others. But I wanna point out uh, a few things in it uh, rather than going through each in detail. So the first is the difference between DC here and AC. We just visualize this as AC is a bit more multi-nodal, whereas DC is a bit more direct and also has a higher capacity. Um, I also wanna point out that these lines are linking 
exporter and importer, in this case, supply areas and demand areas. And both of these have a number of factors that shape sort of how, uh, how these plants develop, where they develop, how large they are, and also who has the political power to shape these regional power geographies. Um, Singeeth and I were talking over lunch about one risk of this approach is that it places too much emphasis on the demand side and shaping the supply side. But we, what we wanna focus on here is that this is relational, that both are shaping each other. And moreover, they're also shaped by, and that's covered up there so you can't see it, but trans-regional and global drivers, which I won't go into, I just wanna point out that they're there, as well, and national drivers too, and others I'm sure that we could come up with. So obviously it's a multi-scalar, but the focus of the power shed is that relational uh, linkage between supply and demand areas or between exporter uh, and importer. And that's the relationship I wanna focus on in the rest of the talk. Um, this, concept, this concept of the power shed speaks directly to kind of a large literature uh, on geographies of energy transition. I seem to have left that slide out, but I just want to talk about it really quickly anyways, if, if folks don't mind, uh, because there is a, a, a strong basis for this in the geographical literature that's worth mentioning. Um, there's been a lot of uh, research, particularly on geographies of uneven transition um, or uneven geographies of transition, uh, particularly in geography. And I know Sangeet has been working on this too. Geographers have kind of been pointing out for about a decade now that transitions have a networked character. They're not just limited to, it, to electricity transmission, but that this networked, networked character of transition is shaped by geographies of dependency and control. So really adding that political power into the mix. Um, and some places exercise power over others in transition with sort of with and through the energy transition meaning that these may be pre-existing power relations that already exist, and they may be exacerbated, they may be accelerated through energy transition, they also may be reshaped through transition, but that there's, there's a real uneven character here. And geographers have also pointed out that control tends to emanate from a core and from the perspective of power shed, kind of like a load center or a city, um, and that this power is then exercised over the periphery, so over rural areas or over in, uh, exporting areas. Um, there's a great paper by uh, a couple of authors, Galub, Chikov, and O'Sullivan from 2020, and they call the places that I'm suggesting are uh, exporters. I might just go back to this one, so at least we have it there. They call these places energy peripheries. And they say that these energy peripheries have a weak political and economic power and a lack of investment. Um, building on this, I've argued in a recent paper that we might conceptualize these places, again, these places here, as low carbon frontiers. These are being continually remade through energy transition and they have a precarious, dependent and volatile relationship with consuming regions because they're so dependent on the demand side for how, where, and why to develop renewable energy and to transmit electricity elsewhere. Um, I think I'll leave it at there for a literature review, but there, it is important to recognize that there's been a lot of uh, work already done to date sort of on these uneven geographies, and we're clearly building on that with this power shed concept. So, let me then move to the outline for the rest of the talk for about 25 minutes. Um, I wanna focus on three aspects here, two of them geographical and then one about China's role given I've uh, been focusing a lot on China. So first I want to just map and analyze China's power sheds. I wanna then talk a little bit about Asia's, but by that I really mean mainly Southeast Asia's. And then I wanna talk about China's role in these power sheds. So starting with China. China, as I mentioned, still relies heavily on coal. Uh, it has throughout its modern history. It's, it's blessed, depending on how you look at it, with pretty massive coal reserves. And the benefits of coal-fired power for its electricity system, uh, as many of you know, you know, provides base load, stable, sort of easily ramped up and down power sources. It's, and it, it's, it's simple. Okay. Um, there's another benefit to it too, geographically speaking, which is that it can be close to consumers. 
So this is a map from a recent paper by Tsui et al. in Nature uh, Communications, um, which shows all of China's coal-fired power stations. Don't really worry about the colors. They're just all basically coal-fired thermal power stations. And notice that uh, they are kind of hugging the east and central areas of China. That's where most of China's population is. And so you can build them really close to population centers. And therefore, you don't need long distance transmission infrastructure in the same way as you do with renewables. This is a major benefit of coal. Um, my, my PhD research from years ago was on um, hydropower and particularly small hydropower in China. One of the reasons I wanted to focus on this in my PhD research is because it's China's first renewable energy source. And so I wanna talk about it a little bit now too, because China's again, long been using coal, but it also has long been using hydropower. Hydropower like coal has a long history in China. The first plant uh, was built in 1911. And in the 1950s and 60s, a number of large plants were constructed in Eastern and Central China, basically in the same kind of places where those coal fired power plants are located because they could be as close to consumers as possible. There are some natural restrictions to where you can build hydropower and you need water. And so there's more water in Southern China than there is in Northern China. So we can already see in this map, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, that they're kind of hugging the South too. Um, but uh, hydropower was still mainly sort of built in the, in the East and Central part of China. Um, there were quite a number of large plants, but also quite a number of small plants, which in China, that definition is under 50 megawatts. That's actually pretty large, but, but that's the definition in China. And so what this map here shows is the distribution of hydropower plants in China in 1990. It's not scaled by size. So some of these are quite large and some of these are just small hydropower plants of one or two gigawatts in size. But again, this is really about the geography. And what I wanna point out is that even though you can see there being a lot more plants in places like here, right? Because that's a very water rich area. They're still kind of hugging sort of, sort of the central and Eastern part of China. And so it still maps onto a similar geography as coal fired power. Because that's where the population is. You wanna build it close to the population. You don't wanna spend so much money on transmission infrastructure and experience transmission loss. Um, well, in the mid 1990s, so a few years after that map, the central government announced the Xidian Dongsong policy or translated send Western electricity east, which is what this shows here. This is based on two main ideas or trends. The first is that the Pearl River Delta around Guangdong province in the, the city of Guangzhou uh, was booming and that it needed power that it didn't have. Um, that's sort of China's main uh, export oriented manufacturing region for a very long time. Uh, and the second idea is that this power could be found elsewhere. It could be found in Western China. And all you needed to do was just send it from the West to the East. Specifically, that power could be found here in Sichuan province here and Yunnan province here. Um, this just is a sort of a Northern uh, middle and Southern quarter. Um, there was also a broader political campaign called Open Up the West, which is about allowing Western China, which was, uh, considered to be less economically developed and poor than central and Eastern China, allowing them to catch up with the East through um, uh, investments um, in infrastructure and, um, and through cash transfers. Uh, and, and then also this fed into that by allowing the West to sell power to the East. So this resulted in a tremendous hydropower boom in China beginning in the late 1990s and actually still continuing. Um, the Three Gorges Dam is the most famous, it gets all the press, but the majority of installed capacity and electricity generation, which is what this uh, chart shows, this is electricity generation, um, is, in, is not where the Three Gorges is, which is in Hubei province, it's actually a little bit further west in Yunnan and Sichuan provinces. I like this, this graph, which is not my own, because it just shows the difference in capacity between the Three Gorges, which again is humongous, right? It's almost done. Um, 20 gigawatts um, compared to the rest of hydroelectricity and the massive growth really starting around here, around the, the time of the send Western electricity east policy. Um, Yunnan and Sichuan, those two Western provinces which are water rich together are by far the world's largest hydropower producing region, by far. Um, so in that same paper uh, where we uh, 
where we uh, developed this power shed concept. We also wanted to map um, power sheds in China and, and Asia. So that's where this image comes from here. Um, this is just a kind of China part of the image and the power sheds are based around these demand centers, which are shown by these red circles here. And so we identified um, uh, five, uh, excuse me, actually four, this is a, in Vietnam, we identified four uh, main power sheds in China. Um, each of them is scaled by that dot to electricity demand in that area. And DC lines here are shown with a thick blue, blue arrow, sort of blue bar. Um, those that are dotted are those that are still under construction. Um, and then notice that uh, while there are AC, like uh, I guess the icons here that we could use on the map, there's not really any AC transmission in any of these power sheds. They're all fully DC based. And one of the main reasons for that is because they're coming from very large hydropower projects or clusters of power, hydropower projects in Yunnan and Sichuan provinces directly to these load centers. The central China plain is just south of Beijing. The Pearl River Delta I talked about already, that's around Guangzhou and also Hong Kong and that entire area. Guangxi is actually a much less populated province, but has a lot of heavy industry. And then this is the one that I've been talking about since the beginning of the talk, the Yangtze River Delta power shed clustered around Shanghai. And that is uh, the biggest. And if, uh, if we think about global power sheds, which I like to do, it's the biggest in the world as well. Um, the, uh, I, I could probably spend longer talking about this map. I'm already 20 minutes in. And so instead, I'll just say that um, what this shows is both um, the, the growing role, an important role of long distance transmission in China, but that specifically this is built on a foundation of hydro. And so that's where a lot of these power sheds sort of started from. And we might just call them hydro power sheds in that way. Um, and, and this is only a trend that's going to continue um, the Chinese government has planned to build many, many, many more hydropower projects, including the world's largest in Tibet autonomous region up here. And that, in the end, is going to go to the Yangtze River Delta power shed. And so there's more coming. Um, but it isn't just hydropower. Um, all renewable energy is booming in Western China. Um, there's about uh, 1,300 gigawatts now capacity of solar and wind, which is 40% of the world's installed capacity. More than half of that is in Western China in places like this. Um, there, uh, th this area here is, um, it, it's very desert-like as you can see. Um, might've been nice to have a, a map of China to show you exactly where this is coming from, but this is coming from the kind of North and Northwest of China and hydropower is coming from the South and Southwest. So it's sort of two different areas. There's not a lot of water here. There's not a lot of hydropower potential, but there is a lot of solar and wind potential. And so you have these new power sheds developing that are built on a backbone, not of hydropower, but of solar and, and to some extent of wind too. Um, and that looks something like this because we haven't yet analyzed these as power sheds, but this IEEE map does show these emerging corridors and you can map some of these onto you know, the concept that I like to use around the power shed this is the Pearl River Delta power shed. This is the Yangtze River Delta power shed. But then what about these? Well, one of these is the new Power Silk Road uh, transmission line that I showed that image of. And these are coming from even further distances and they're ending up in that uh, North China Plain power shed that's just south of Beijing. And eventually this will be flowing to Beijing too. So now Beijing, which actually was mainly built on uh, coal, and so just uh, having local coal to use, and then a little bit of wind from Inner Mongolia is now importing all this solar and wind 3,000 kilometers from Northwest China. And so this shows where we're seeing some emerging power sheds and not just hydro power sheds, but power sheds built on a broader suite of renewable energy resources. And this is only the beginning. The state grid and the China Southern Power Grid, China's two major grid companies, have announced even more investment in transmission infrastructure in the future. So we're just going to see more and more of this as electricity demand continues to rise. And as China keeps pursuing this goal of peaking carbon emissions by 2030 and going to zero by 2060. Well, so this is, this is framed as very necessary for China to meet these goals. Um, and especially for energy intensive cities like Shanghai, which are kind of leading the way. Right? Everybody's looking to Shanghai uh, for leadership. Um, it is also framed as an opportunity for Western China for economic development. 
Um, just as uh, this kind of initial argument about hydropower uh, offering economic development opportunity 20 years ago, same argument is coming back again um, in this kind of same region of Western China. But because of the direction of electricity flows and of, I argue, flows of political power, Western China has kind of been caught as a resource provider for the East, a resource provider for places like Shanghai. It makes it vulnerable, as I've argued, in terms of low carbon frontiers, it makes it vulnerable policy and price swings, which actually happen quite a lot because the government's still working this out. Um, it uh, makes it vulnerable to over-enthusiastic local governments and developers that build too many plants before they can be connected to the grid or before they have an off ticker that's been assigned. Uh, and it leaves them vulnerable in the case of hydropower, especially to climate change. Right? If you build too much hydropower and then there's a large drought. Meanwhile, local communities, um, while they're, um, while the government's rhetoric is that they're going to benefit greatly from this, they don't. Um, they may gain some initial benefit if their agricultural land is being used for these projects because they'll receive some, um, some money, small amounts of money for leasing this land. Um, but over the long term, there's no actual benefit in terms of more stable electricity or cheaper electricity or anything like that. They are simply just places that are producing for somebody else. Um, and again, electricity is not distributed to this local area. It goes immediately into DC lines and gets transmitted all the way across China. Moreover, electricity generation in these places, you see these large scale power plants and think, well, perhaps this could attract industry to use cheap electricity. This also has not yet happened. There are some plans in the works for one province in particular to bring solar manufacturing there, but it's a long way from everything else. And solar manufacturers don't want to build a factory there unless they're being made to, and they're not being made to yet. And so the current trend is that local benefits are just simply not a commute. Okay, got about 15 minutes left, maybe a little bit less, maybe more like 12 minutes. Let me talk about Asia's power sheds, and then if we have time, I'll talk about China's role in these power sheds. Um, these are much smaller and more emergent than in China. And so a little bit, uh, actually quite a lot different, but I'll talk about how. Um, a few months ago, um, I, uh, I went to China to conduct some field work and I also went um, to um, a couple of conferences uh, in Bangkok and in Beijing. Um, w one of these in Bangkok was right on the heels of uh, the Asia Pacific Energy Week, uh, which is an entire week um, about uh, just discussing energy transition across Asia. And this was hosted in, in, in Singapore. So I spoke to a lot of people in Bangkok who had just come from this conference. Um, everybody's really excited about all the investment opportunities in energy transition, meaning renewable energy, grid infrastructure, and all those kinds of things. But there was one thing in particular that everybody wanted to talk about that was on the that was just the main topic of discussion. And this is the LTMS PIP. And this stands for the Lao Thai Malaysia Singapore Power Integration Project. This is what everybody wanted to talk about. And that's was it the topic of this panel here. That's an integration project, by the way, which I'll talk about in a moment that integrates those four countries through electricity transmission. This is not the only integration that Southeast Asia particularly through this uh, platform of ASEAN, is hoping for. This is another conference, one I actually attended at the UN Economic and Social Commission for the Asia Pacific Energy Forum. This was in Bangkok. And everybody at these events was not only talking about power integration, but wanted to kind of highlight and spruik their own resources and how they could be transmitted, i.e. exported to others. So you have this situation in which Singapore in particular is really keen to invest in import power and you have other countries kind of figuring out how they're going to sell that to Singapore. So I wanna read a few quotes that I jotted down when I was sitting in the back of this conference. The Lao energy, every, every country got a, a chance to just get up and talk for a moment about energy transition in their country. So here's what the Lao energy minister said. He said, Lao has abundant hydropower, wind and solar resources. We already export to Thailand and Singapore, and we're studying a new subsea cable through either Southern Vietnam or Cambodia. 
the Mongolia energy minister stood up and said, Mongolia has excellent hydropower, solar, and wind sources that can be supplied to China and North Asia. We should also be laying the foundation for increased cross-border transmission. And the Tajikistan minister stood up and said, hydropower is dominant in the electricity mix in Tajikistan. We're exploring solar and wind. 60% of our future production of environmentally clean energy will be exported to neighboring countries. So you get the picture. Everybody's talking about this. Um, there are talks about their power integration projects, but I just want to focus on the LT in this one here. Um, but here's the thing, that power integration in, in the Asia Pacific right now, um, especially that that includes solar and wind, it's very low compared to China. Um, in fact, solar and wind-based power integration in the Asia Pacific is almost non-existent. Uh, almost all the power sheds are based on hydropower. Um, and from that same paper, these are hydropower sheds only. And so we identified six major hydropower sheds across uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, I think you remember, you know, what the, the circles refer to. We've got China over here. Look how much bigger those are than these other circles. And then this is Bangkok here. Uh, for those of you familiar with Southeast Asia and a little bit of electricity politics there, Thailand's been importing electricity from Laos for many, many years. But that's how it compares. And so it's still a big deal, but it's useful to put it in this comparative perspective. Others that are really small and developing are around Greater Kolkata, around Ho Chi Minh City, um, which is some uh, imports from, uh, from, from Laos, um, but also from actually just Northern Vietnam. Uh, you've got a new DC line that's being built from Eastern India to the Central Delhi region. And then another line that's being built across Central Asia to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, again, these are not nearly as large as China, but they do reveal an important trend that these power sheds are growing in scale and scope, and that power inputs and exports are a big part of Asia Pacific's energy transition future. Here's a table from there. Just again, all I'll say about this in the interest of time is just let's compare China to elsewhere and notice just how much more electricity demand and supply we're talking about in the Chinese case. Nevertheless, these power sheds here are important, and the biggest in the Asia Pacific is the Gulf of Thailand, i.e. that that's based around Bangkok, Bangkok's electricity imports, uh, mainly from Laos. So then the LTMS PIP project, the Lao Thai Malaysia Singapore Power Integration Project. This is a great schematic that kind of lays out what this looks like. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that, so here's Laos and then here's Singapore. Um, this is over 2,000 kilometers. Uh, this infrastructure already exists. Nothing had to be built in order to launch this project. It was about building an electricity market. And the two countries through which this power passes, Thailand and Malaysia, are known as wheeling countries. They kind of wheel that electricity and send it on. Um, interestingly, it's not necessarily the same electricity, right? So if it comes from a hydropower plant in Laos, but then it wheels through Thailand, then Thailand also produces some of its own power. It simply accepts power from Laos and then it sends along the same amount of power to Singapore. And so here you've got the dam in Laos, the Shaiburi Dam from which this comes, and then you've got Singapore here at the bottom. Um, the main, one of the main actors involved here, and you won't be able to see it, but it's here, is the state-owned utility of Laos, which is called Electricité du Lao. And Electricité du Lao uh, manages a, most of these hydropower plants, not all of them, but most of them, um, and has existing uh, power purchase agreements with uh, Thailand's um, electricity grid and also now with Singapore's. Um, the amount of power flowing through this LTMS project is still pretty small. It's still in a pilot phase, but people are excited that it seems to be working. And so this is one of the, the sort of most important pilot projects for cross-border transmission. Um, there is a big problem though, and it's not just related to the LTMS PIP, it's related to sort of much more longstanding pre-existing issues with hydropower and Laos and its relationship to Thailand specifically. And it's that electricity du Lao, Laos Electricity Grid uh, Management Company is on the verge of bankruptcy. It's in really, really bad financial straits. It's been locked into these long-term contracts with the Thai grid called EGAT, 
um, when it sells power directly to Thailand, doesn't even enter into what we might call the Lao grid. And those contracts have a purchase price for power that's far too low. And so Lao entered into those contracts and they're stuck in them. They can't get enough money out of them. And so one thing that Lao is then doing is actually developing more hydropower projects using Chinese finance in order to sort of like generate their way out of this crisis. But this has been a major issue for a long time. Um, is uh, EDL's uh, sort of major financial constraints and the fact that it uh, keeps having to be bailed out. And uh, it has recently been bailed out yet again by China, by China's China Southern Power Grid or the CSPG. Um, that's the Chinese company mentioned here. Um, the CSPG, starting in the early 2020s, started to um, negotiate with EDL about a purchase of some of EDL's assets. And this was concluded in 2021 with the purchase of um, about 80% of EDL's transmission assets. And then the China Southern Power Grid spun this off into a new company called EDLT, standing for transmission. Um, I said 80% and it's actually 90% now that I look at my, at my notes, 90% stake in EDL. Um, the China Southern Power Grid also owns, uh, has an equity stake in three hydropower projects in Laos. Um, so this is a stake that allows them to operate those hydropower plants and then also allows them to operate that transmission infrastructure too. Um, Laos still technically owns that transmission infrastructure, but it is operated by the China Southern Power Grid. And the name of the company is EDLT. However, I've been to their company headquarters and everything says China Southern Power Grid and it's full of China Southern Power Grid employees and they just have a handful of local employees. Okay, so finally, a little bit about China's role in Asia's power sheds. I've got maybe one minute left, I think. It's okay. Okay. Um, so let me be fairly quick through here because this is actually a little bit more of a, just some questions I wanna raise for future research. Uh, so clearly China, as we can see from EDL, has a stake in how Asia Pacific's power sheds are developing. Um, this is a map that's provided by the folks at the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University. Um, I really appreciate the work that they do in mapping out China's overall energy investments. Um, as you can see, China's invested a lot in the dark blue hydropower across the world. Let's focus on the Asia Pacific over here. And we can see that there's a lot of coal, that's the brown. Um, gas is, oil and gas are, are sort of not particularly important here, but just notice the coal investments, the dark blue for hydropower investments. Oh, here's gas, the light blue is gas. And then the yellow is a little bit of solar. And so there's starting to be a little bit of renewable energy investment from Chinese firms and Chinese financiers and parts of the Asia Pacific, but it has mainly been hydropower investments. The purpose of showing this is just to say that China has had a role in electricity generation in the Asia Pacific and elsewhere for a while, particularly through its Belt and Road Initiative. But it has also been investing in grids. So EDL is just one case of many. EDL is, I think, a special case, the Lao case, because it's a 90% stake, so it's a controlling stake. But not to go through this image, which comes from another paper, not my own, but this just shows China's stakes in different electricity grids, both in the global north and south. And again, these investments are coming from two major grid companies, the state grid and the China Southern Power Grid. And so this is a, also a big trend that China is not just involved in generation, but also involved in transmission because those two things are interlinked. And then before I conclude, I wanna talk a little bit about a specific organization in China that has been not especially driving this, but has been at the forefront of policy development around grid investments and grid infrastructure development through the Belt and Road Initiative. And this is the Global Energy Interconnection Development and Cooperation Organization, or GUIDECO. GUIDECO was announced by President Xi Jinping in 2017. Um, it is an arm of China's state grid corporation. And so it's kind of like a research institute affiliated with the state grid, with state grid employees that are seconded to this organization. Um, it has a lot of fans, like it has a lot of supporters outside of China. At that Bangkok uh, meeting that I showed an image of, Singapore meeting, and also at COP28 in Dubai, which I attended, Geico was a big presence. 
and they hosted events with a lot of uh, VIPs who were there spruiking Geico's work. Um, I want to read a couple of quotes if I have time uh, and then maybe conclude. Uh, so uh, UN, uh, one of the, the UN Secretary Generals um, for Economic and Social Affairs said that interconnection of global energy infrastructure can significantly contribute to achieving energy access and sustainable development, providing energy to multiple countries while reducing the cost. You can start to see the argument in this. Another UN Secretary General for the UN Development, uh, sorry, for UNDP, sustainable transition strategy is at the heart of our mission of the UNDP and collaboration between GuideCo and the UNDP is an excellent example of these efforts. GuideCo has uh, led capacity building and upper efforts to help African countries achieve energy transition and sustainable development. And then finally, the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization said, we would like to see GuideCo's innovative technology spread throughout the world and available to all countries. So GuideCo, as you've now guessed, is all about interconnecting countries' grids. And the argument that they make for this is not just about connectivity and Belt and Road Initiative and that kind of thing. It's also about that this is going to enable and accelerate energy transition because it will enable places like Laos and Mongolia and Tajikistan that say they have all this power and they want to export it elsewhere. It'll enable that. It'll connect the generators to the, to the demand centers, i.e. the exporters to the importers. And so they've been sharing this concept, sharing a lot of research and going around to conferences and really thinking about how they're going to connect uh, not just China and Laos or uh, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore, but everywhere. So this is a map, a real one from Geico, about what a global interconnected grid would look like. And, and uh, I, mean, I mean, obviously, Geico is full of very smart people, right? And so like, this is, a, this is sort of funny to look at, maybe, because it seems like a bit of a pipe dream. It's not really about that, though, I don't think. It's about showing here it's conceptually why interconnection is important. Here's some of the things that we could do with our technology. Now, this is Geico speaking. Now, what can we do for you? Right. And so this is a foray into the ability to invest in grid infrastructure elsewhere. But it also shows this trend of not just Geico, not just China's leaders, but leaders in ASEAN and throughout the Asia Pacific thinking about interconnection as a way to accelerate energy transition and to link these exporting areas that have all this potential to importing areas. And of course, there are a lot of challenges involved in that. We'd be happy to talk about those in the Q&A. And then there's also the challenge of local benefits not accruing to places because that electricity is simply exported elsewhere. And so to conclude, I think I just have one slide here, so I'll be quick. Um, a few thoughts to part with. And again, this is a kind of an early stage of this, of this project. So first, Extensive long distance and cross border electricity imports are central to China, already to China's energy transition, and they're becoming much more central to transition in Southeast Asia and, and the Asia Pacific in general. Um, China is both a model of this because it has been uh, developing long distance transmission through DC for a very long time. And it's also a driver of it through organizations like Geico, through the state grid and China Southern Power Grid's investments. Um, and this will only continue as well. And I, I want to leave us and then argue uh, one last time that I think the power shed framework or the sort of idea of a power shed has been helpful for my colleagues and I in tracing and comparing these new power geographies and thinking about not just the material flows of energy, but also flows of socio-political power relations and their distribution of benefits and costs, which again, tend to accrue more to demand areas than they do to supply. That's my last slide. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, um, Tyler. Thanks. Yeah. I'll stand up here. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation, and it really shows you what um, at how many different scales you can work when you look at energy geographies, from the kind of left behind regions through to these kind of centers of power in both, at, like in the geopolitical sense, and this kind of um, vision of global interconnection, which at one uh, it looks kind of um, visionary and emancipatory on the one hand, but also looks kind of scary and particularly in terms of 
who's buying transmission assets and who's controlling them. It's got lots of implications. Um, so I wanted to say thanks so much for that. Um, I just wanted to ask one question, and I'm happy to open it up to the group. So um, this idea of um, the power shed is very valuable. Um, and I can see how mapping power sheds helps us to see these interconnections much more clearly. I was just wondering whether you could explore more how interconnection within a nation state um, is qualitatively different from interconnection across state borders. And the LTMS is a good example of that because there's a whole history of geopolitical conflict between those countries and cooperation as well. So I was just wondering whether you could expand on that a bit more. Let's hear that question. So can can the microphone hear you? Or, I think it's fine. It's uh, not in the shot. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, yes, you're right. They're very different. Um, I mean, geo the geopolitics comes into play when you're talking about cross national borders. And the LTMS, one of the difficulties in developing that project and getting it off the ground, which took many, many years. Actually, ASEAN has been talking about power integration for many decades. It's just that it is an issue of energy security. Um, but I also don't want to downplay how difficult it can, it can be within a nation state um, and even one that's so centralized as China, because China, uh, as some of you might have heard this term, is sort of it's centralized and authoritarian, but it's a bit fragmented, too. So a lot of scholars will talk about fragmented authoritarianism, which means that provinces and local areas do have a lot of leeway with how they develop renewable energy. Uh, and so one of the main challenges in the Chinese case over the past decade, and we were talking about this over lunch, is that there were a lot of solar and wind uh, installations that were built, and they either weren't connected to the grid at all, because local governments kind of went gangbusters before there was demand for it, or actually a bigger issue was that there weren't, the electricity market wasn't set up um, to enable this kind of long distance transmission and purchases from one province from another province, and provinces that in the east, near cities, just wanted to buy their own coal instead of buy solar and wind uh, even if it was cheap, they didn't want to risk being reliant on solar and wind from Western China um, and, and coming over those long distances. So that's a challenge to overcome too. Um, and it required a lot of reforms in electricity markets and a lot of time to develop that transmission infrastructure. And so you're right, they're totally different. And I think there are a lot more obstacles to transnational transmission. And I don't see the Guideco dream happening anytime soon. If it's that hard to do it in China, if it's that hard to do it in Australia or America for that matter, you know, like Texas has its own grid that's not really going to be connected anytime soon in any major way. And so uh, all the more than difficult is it to do it across uh, national borders. Yeah. Um, just one other follow up. Um, to what extent do you think the hydro power sheds? Um, so the transmission assets that we built for hydro can enable a net zero pathway um, to enable renewables. To what extent is there a kind of co-evolution that's possible? Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, all of these power sheds are built on hydropower initially, which doesn't mean they have to be. Actually, let me take that back. Almost all of them. The new one I showed from Northwest China is built on solar and wind. But what I didn't say with that, th those new lines that I was pointing out in that map, that were coming from Northwest China is that there's a lot of coal there too, to provide stability for the grid. And so at the moment, as battery technology continues to improve, but is not widely deployed, there is a need for that stable electricity source. And that can be provided by hydropower. And it is provided by hydropower in the case of all of these power sheds. And what that means is that it provides a foundation for which solar and wind can build upon, and it can better integrate those uh, variable resources over time. But like many of us, I, I think, in this room, too, I'm very skeptical of hydropower. And I see a lot of cases in China and in Southeast Asia where hydropower has been built with no thought for local effects, where people have uh, had to migrate elsewhere, where they've lost their lands and livelihoods. So there's big issues with hydropower. It is considered a renewable energy by the UNFCCC. It can be included in a nationally determined contribution commitments. So we can expect that there's going to be a lot more in the future. But we need to recognize that if we're comparing solar and wind and hydropower, then I'm definitely on the solar and wind side. Uh, there's just some technical challenges to overcome. Thanks very much. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Back. Hi. Thanks for your talk, Tyler. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Sophie, and I'm a PhD student at Arkham 
I kind of a follow on question. I guess one thing that really stood out to me was uh, one of the main sort of transition lines you mentioned was from uh, autonomous region of China to you know, one of the central regions. I think you, you spoke a bit about uh, local benefits not accruing. Have you guys considered in your conceptualization that maybe things could be even a step further, like attempts to sort of destabilize regions in terms of, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to phrase that. I think you understand. That. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of excellent scholarship over the years, particularly in political ecology, about the role of hydropower as a territorializing strategy, mm -hmm. right? To, maintain control over, say, rested border regions. Definitely that's been the case in China. Definitely it's been the case in Southeast Asia. Um, for solar and wind, and in this particular example of Xinjiang Autonomous Region, which where Uyghur people live, and I think a lot of us are aware, sort of, I'm just gonna say human rights abuses occurring there. Um, whether this allows for further control over that region, I probably wouldn't go that far because I think the control has already been sort of, uh, you know, accelerated by these other investments, um, both energy investments and also just investment in securitization of that region. Um, but I think it's a good point uh, overall. And I do think it, it comes into play here, particularly in ASEAN countries like, let's say, Myanmar, right? It's been developing hydropower, uh, doesn't have that kind of electricity demand itself. And so those hydropower plants are being developed for export. And so it does implicate then the demand center or the importer in the kind of... Uh, uh, territorialization of these uh, border regions through hydropower and other projects like that. And so I think it's uh, really important to keep that in mind. Um, yes. Uh, um, Alex Quo, I'm a communications director with Corio Generation. We're an offshore wind developer owned by Antari. Mm -hmm. So the inevitable question, given my background, is you know, what are your sort of observations with offshore wind in the whole mix of what's happening? and uh, yeah, in your thoughts there. I'm glad you brought this up because offshore wind in China, uh, which is accelerating quite quickly, mm -hmm. is, is near the eastern seaboard. Yeah. And so it doesn't have this problem of transmission, of long distance transmission. It's just, I mean, uh, you, you would tell us all better than me, but it's just expensive, right? I think is, is one of the main issues and one of the things that, that China has committed to developing because in part, it doesn't want to be completely reliant on imports from Northwest China. And because it has very, very good um, offshore wind resources. I think there's a really interesting case too here in Australia, and I wonder if your firm is involved in this in Gippsland? Gippsland, right? Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I, I think this is, this is a little bit different, and I wonder if there are experts in the room about this too who would be able to speak about this, because um, from the framework that I provided, you know, Gippsland then is an electricity exporter to say Melbourne and other places, which would put them at a disadvantage. I've argued that these types of places, you know, are uh, not receiving local community benefit. Um, Uncertain, and I might even venture to say that's not really the case here in the Gippsland um, case because uh, there's been so much uh, local and state government uh, involvement in and development of sort of like a transition strategy for this region. And including, I think, interestingly, from uh, mining positions or, or jobs in coal fired power to jobs in offshore wind. And so I don't know enough about this to speak to whether it's been effective or not, but I do think these are the types of um, strategies that need to be in place for these types of regions in order to allow them to thrive under energy transition. We can't just expect that to happen without supports and without policies in place. That's probably what's uh, Yes. Hi, Todd. Thanks again for a great talk. Uh, I'm James Frith. I, I work in the construction sector, particularly with renewables. Um, I just wondered if you had a comment on the proposed Sun Cable project. I, I see you had a line connecting Australia to Singapore, and I was interested to, to know whether that project's in direct competition with the LTMS or both would be needed. I'm really glad you asked that because I, I wanted to bring that up and I forgot. Um, my understanding of where that project at is at the moment is that the economics of the subsea cable to Singapore haven't stacked up for at least one of the investors. And so the investors investment team has split and now the focus of that project, you might be not up to date about this, is on the production of green hydrogen within Australia, and then exporting that as part of Australia's overall hydrogen export strategy. Um, this does seem to make more economic sense because you can still build that large scale uh, solar facility, one of the world's largest, 
but rather than Singapore being so reliant on this one project, rather than all kinds of things can happen to a subsea cable, I presume. Instead, you can use it 24 seven, uh, excuse me, you can use it and then store it with batteries, right? And you can kind of continually produce power for hydrogen, for green hydrogen, which can be used in industrial applications. It can be used in hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and all these new applications um, that countries in the Asia Pacific need. That's my understanding where that project is at the moment. Um, but there were deep discussions with Singapore about how that would be a part of their energy mix. And if it's not going to happen, then Singapore needs to replace it with something else. And they're in discussions as well with a, about a subsea cable from Cambodia, from hydropower projects that are being financed with Chinese finance and built by Chinese firms. Is there anything online? Um, there's one that was already answered, similar question. Oh, okay, and we're just over time as well. Does anyone else have a pressing? question. Okay, well, um, please join me on thanking Tyler for a fantastic presentation. Layers and layers of knowledge and expertise embedded in that. And um, perhaps if you're happy, Tyler, you can stick around afterwards for some questions. Sure. Feel free to email me too. Okay, and just a reminder that the uh, recording will be up on the University of Melbourne YouTube channel next week. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.